Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike DeLaCluse. I'm the president of Lessman Instrument Company. It's uh, 9 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for our seventh customer webinar. Uh, today we're going to introduce you to a different way of thinking about load cells. We're honored today to have Steve Watson from Sartorius as our presenter. Steve is currently a strike team member at Sartorius, keenly focused on taking tank and hopper weighing. Steve has 35 years experience with all aspects of industrial weighing. As a strike team member, Steve is responsible for making sure the most complex tank and weighing applications get solved. In the past 35 years, he's seen it all from ultra micro laboratory balances to his current position as technical sales manager for high capacity weighing. Please be sure to ask Steve about any of your difficult weighing applications as we go through the uh, presentation. We will be leaving the phone lines open, so if you have some background noise, please mute your phone. If you have any questions, please feel free to speak up at any time. This is for you, so we want uh, you to get the most out of it that you possibly can. With that introduction, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Steve. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, I think Mike hit it accurately there. Um, we do some different things with load cells. Load cells are a technology that, in fact, been around for well, over 50 years at this stage. Um, but and the basic weighing principles that we use in our load cells are the same as they have been for the last 50 years. But what you'll see as we go through the presentation is the refinement that has gone into our particular version of tank weighing cells. Um, it's not magic. It is just a extreme refinement of a proven technology. But we'll talk about that in detail that for you in a second. One thing that I wanted to go through here first, and I always get the question, eh, not always, but occasionally, often enough to go over it now, you know, how do these devices actually function? Well, we make a distinction with our load cells. They function exactly the same as, as uh, most load cells that you may be accustomed to seeing generally called shear beam cells, but we use a different form which we call vertical compression cells. And as we go through the presentation, you'll see why that is so critical. The way our load cell functions, and in fact all load cells function, is with what they call a strain gauge, which is nothing more than a, a matrix of uh, micro-resistors. Uh, as you push on the load cell, it it stretches or um, reduces the size of the matrix of uh, resistors. And that change, of course, gives us a change in output voltage. Output voltage we read as a weight. Um, the trick is that you have a very, very, very small movement. And you see, as on the last bullet point here, sartorius load cells actually move 0.5 millimeter or less from a completely unloaded condition to full capacity, regardless of the size of the load cell. So even in our largest tank applications, and our largest, by the way, would be in the 3 million pound range, um, even our largest tank applications where we have 100,000 or 200,000 kilo load cell, the entire amount of movement is half a millimeter. So we have to be very careful about certain forces that can affect the accuracy of the load cells, most of them external. Uh, but as we as we go through, we're going to detail some of those things. As we get to the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, design considerations, cost considerations, and other things that you may be interested in. Uh, there's a lot of ways to save money and a lot of ways to do things right actually for less. And we want to be sure to cover that as we get towards the end. But for now, let's kind of go into where we fit into the marketplace. I've kind of coined this name here, Extreme Way. Extreme weighing is just sort of my name for some of those things you see on the left. We cover just about every uh, difficult application for tank and hopper weighing. Um, the three bullet points in the middle there, you can kind of have a, a quick look and you can see right away where we are different than some of the load cells you may have uh, used in the past. Victoria's worked every load cell to be free of defects for 15 years of continuous use. The warranty applies to just about everything, including lightning strikes, submersion, exposure to most caustic chemicals, 
or even failure to maintain the certified values, calibration values that were shipped from the factory. The only thing, in fact, that is not covered under our warranty is if you uh, strike a weld across the load cell that will definitely short out the strain gauge um, bridge or overload it by more than 500% of its rate of capacity. Those are basically the only two ways to destroy the load cell. And then finally, all load cells in the Sartorius line are factory mutual approved, so they can be used in any explosive environment. Kind of the, to wrap that piece up, I think, I've, I've again, a little phrase here just to help us remember. We basically cover the, the broadest ends of the weighing range. Explosive, extreme heat and cold, dirty, seismic, caustic, flooded, and clean rooms, ironically. Clean rooms present a particular challenge, almost as difficult as the dirty, seismic, uh, heat and cold environments. So pretty much everything at the extreme ends of weighing are the areas in which Sartorius specializes. I'll kind of, this sort of line drawing here of a load cell may be something that you, you may have uh, seen in your own facility. Certainly they are the most common types of load cells that are used. And I want to kind of give you an idea of why we don't use this type of load cell for tank and hopper weighing. Uh, the load cell that you see pictured here is what's generically called a shear beam load cell. It mounts very nicely, uh, very easily. It's, um, uh, as I say, quite common. Uh, there are many variants of it, but pretty much all the same principle. That load cell actually flexes in the middle. And you can see from uh, the uh, tank leg or gusset there is uh, sitting on one end. It's a mounting surface, usually a concrete floor on the other end. And in a perfect loading scenario, it works quite well. In fact, we find that the shear beam type cells do well for storage tanks and other applications that are not very demanding, where there's no agitation, where there's not a lot of uh, heat and cold, where they're not explosive environments. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a shear beam cell. But for most of the applications we cover with agitators and so on, uh, it's not working too well. And here's the reason why. The temperature will have a dramatic effect on that cell. One thing we love to see is a perfect downforce on any load cell. What we don't want to see is a horizontal force, and temperature certainly causes that. That could be outdoor temperature. That could be the temperature of um, heating and cooling a system on the tank itself. There's a number of reasons why that would load cell would expand and contract. The load cell itself does not make a distinction which direction the force comes from. Of course, the only thing that represents actual downforce is the load. The temperature appears to be downforce because it's compressing and stretching that strain gauge that's attached to the top of that load cell. Uh, of course, temperature is not a force we want to measure, but nonetheless, it does interact with a shear beam cell on a tank system. We also see uplift, which is a situation that occurs fairly frequently, especially during discharge and loading of a tank. Uh, uplift can also occur in industrial applications where you have load cells underneath a flatbed scale. And perhaps a, a heavy load is loaded on one side very suddenly, and it actually lifts up the other side of the scale. That uplift is actually seen as a force to a shear beam cell, which is something that would give you a, uh, an incorrect reading on the actual downforce weight of the cell. And finally, and probably the one that's most common, is the torsional force that occurs on shear beam load cells, where you have a mixer, for example, that when you turn it on, there's a very sudden jolt to the tank. There's material inside. And of course, the more viscous the material inside, the more difficult it is for that tank to stay in a perfectly level position. If by turning on a mixer, the shear beam load cell sees a torsional force, as illustrated in the, in the drawing here, you're going to have some problems. It will be interpreted as a weight value, and of course, that's not what you want to see. Now, I just spent a lot of time telling you why shear beam load cells are a problem. I have to confess, the truth of the matter is that we use more shear beam load cells than any other type of load cell at Sartorius. But we never use them for tank installations. They work extremely well for platform scales and bench scales especially um, in situations where they are standalone devices. They usually don't encounter external side forces. They don't um, have problems with heat and cold. Uh, they're usually standalone devices where we can control the environment in total. Uh, platform scales are completely self-contained. 
uh, we control the weight loading, we control the readout, we control every aspect of it, and under those conditions, certainly a shear beam load cell is just fine. As I said, we use more of those on our bench and platform scales than we do any other type of load cell. But we use only vertical compression load cells for our tank and vessel uh, applications to avoid some pretty horrendous external influences. And there's a combination of uh, mechanical design and constraining that will allow us to produce a more repeatable and linear weight in a tank application, really for the lifetime of the cell. Here's some typical uh, installations that we see uh, that you probably have part of your tanks at your facilities right now. The most common are pipe connections. Obviously, we wouldn't have a tank if we didn't have something connected to it. And pipe connections do impact the accuracy of a typical cell. Uh, pipe connections will impact the accuracy of our load cells as well, but to a lesser extent, and I'll show you why in a few minutes. There's a real good test you can do for uh, to see the impact of a pipe connection, and it's as simple as this. If you've got a bathroom scale at home, reach your arm out and hold on to the uh, towel bar in the bathroom. You will see a very dramatic effect. Ironically, the stiffer that you hold your arm, the more impact you will see as, as opposed to not having your arm on the towel rack at all. And that is a simulated pipe connection. If you flex your arm, you'll see the impact is less. And that's exactly why we, uh, wherever possible, we like to see flexible connections. Uh, a lot of tanks, especially very large tanks, are constrained externally. Uh, they may be very tall. It may not be practical to support them from the top. So they tie uh, check rods or constraining rods to the tank themselves. This also will show up as a, an influence on the actual weight reading. and something that uh, we address directly in the load cell kit. We'll look at that uh, shortly. A very common installation is where you have mixers, especially mixers that, and I'm not quite sure why, maybe somebody can tell me someday, they seem to want to mount at a 45 degree angle over the edge of the tank. Uh, it's one thing to have a vertical mixer, but it's another to have a mixer that's so heavy that it actually tends to tilt the tank and causing an uplift on some of the load cells. Those are all issues that can be pretty serious problems on a shear beam system. Side forces are ones that are usually created by heat and cold, um, heating and cooling jackets. Most of the time, though, we see this in outdoor tanks. If you have an outdoor tank that has to be extremely accurate, you can see some side forces from wind movement and other um, just weather factors will create problems that most shear beam cells will see uh, quite readily, unfortunately. And then finally, the load cell mounting surface itself. Uh, keep in mind that uh, <clears throat> the load cells move very little from top to bottom. So if you have an uneven floor um, that uh, maybe drains that are in the way of a tank leg or something along that line, where the load cell is experiencing a non-level uh, foundation that's actually mounted to, that can also cause a pretty significant influence in the accuracy of your tank system. This will give you some idea of what the actual <clears throat> um, constrainers and uh, mounting kits we use consist of. Rather than simply mounting a rectangular beam to the foot and to the leg of the tank, we actually mount it in a mounting kit that will help account for both thermal expansion and torsional force of a mixer. Now, on the right-hand photo there, you can see one of our small mounting kits. Uh, the top plate, which unfortunately you can't quite see from a static photo here, but that top plate actually swivels. So if the thermal uh, expansion from a heating or cooling jacket is causing the tank to expand or contract, that top plate will actually absorb those loads by um, tilting as much as two or three degrees, still maintaining a perfect vertical force on that load zone. Of course, vertical force is all we ever want to see in weighing tanks. The horizontal blue line there is one that represents the um, torsional force that might be experienced in a typical uh, mixer application. I mentioned a second ago that we sometimes see constrainers that are tying the tops of the tanks to walls and ceilings and so on to keep them from twisting under the load or the sudden uh, torsional force of a mixer. Uh, we find the best solution is what we have here, where we actually constrain the tank right where it matters, at the load cell. So that uh, horizontal bar actually is able to keep the tank from twisting at the point where the load cell is located. Now, quite honestly, the tank can still twist at the top. Uh, but we don't care so much about 
that portion of it, at least from a weighing perspective. If we can keep the tank from twisting where we are sensing the load, we've made a huge step forward. The drawing on the left just kind of gives you a typical installation of how these look. Um, that's a three-legged tank uh, where you've got the constrainers all sort of pointing the same direction. That will keep any torsional uh, sudden uh, movements uh, completely in check. I'll give you some sort of uh, photo examples of the difference of how these uh, load cells functions relative to the shear beam type you see on the top, and then the um, we have a couple of different versions of our compression cells. The one we show here is a taller compression cell. The, uh, the shear beam on the top, in fact, there's a photo to the right there. You can kind of get some idea of what it looks like in a typical installation. You can see where the leg comes down. You can see where the foot attaches to the floor. The problem is, should that be suddenly jolted sideways, that load cell will introduce a, an apparent weight value to the instrumentation. Of course, there is no weight value in a torsional force and it becomes a problem. What we do on the sartorius cells, and here's a typical installation. I, I took this photo in particular because of what's happened here. You can see the load cell, which is that tall canister in the, underneath the foot, is actually tilted already. That is not a problem. The way uh, most of our load cells are manufactured is very similar to those, there was a name for these when I was a kid, but I don't recall what it was, kind of a punch toy. When you punch it, it goes to the floor and then immediately uprights stands up. And the closer it falls to the floor, the uh, more upward force it exerts coming uh, back vertical. It's exactly the same way that our load cells are filled. That load cell, even off, what, three, four, or five degrees, I would estimate, from perfectly vertical, is functioning fine. There is absolutely no difficulty because we're still seeing the load introduced in a perfectly vertical downforce. As that load cell leans off the side, the radius on the top on the top of the load cell here and on the bottom of the load cell here actually cause the, the load cell to slightly grow in length. So it actually offsets that additional distance between the bottom of the leg and the, and the uh, bottom of the mounting kit. So even if it's falling off to one side a little bit, as you see, it still maintains exactly the same height and exactly that vertical force that we want to see to get an accurate weight. Going to look a little bit about load cell evaluation standards because, uh, well, the spec games go on. What can I say? Um, we, uh, you will find most load cells are evaluated with a couple of different criteria. We actually, in fact, you'll see it here to the right, um, the typical testing criteria for most load cells only includes the hysteresis and linearity specification. We do those, but we also do temperature effect on zero. That is, as the temperature change, how much will the zero point change? Uh, the temperature effect on span, uh, how much will it affect the actual accuracy of the, of the load cell based on a temperature change? Repeatability, which is simply a measure of an on and off load, um, sometimes uh, sequential, off and on, just to check to see that it does the same thing every time. But the most important one is the bottom one, creep. Creep is a measure of how much the load cell will drift under load over days, weeks, and months. And that's a particularly important specification that you need to pay attention to when you're specifying load cells. Uh, how, how long will your tank stay loaded? Um, will it be something that um, is, has any evaporation? Will there be other issues that you need to separate from what the creep might be? And of course, the, the less creep from um, day one to day 20 is exactly what we're trying to accomplish. But rather than guess at it, we test every single load cell for all six of those specifications. Now we actually have load cell tolerances up to eight thousandths of a percent. Uh, these are expensive load cells. And uh, I suppose by rights, I should be really excited about these. But the truth of the matter is, we find that in most installations, uh, spending the extra money for very, very high accuracy load cells is not money well spent. Most of the time, we find the influences from tank connections, from out of level installations, from um, uh, different vibrations that are not predictable, uh, mixer agitation, especially horizontal screw feeders are difficult. They all contribute to decreasing the actual accuracy of the tank. And I'm a big believer in not buying load cells that are more accurate 
then the tank will allow you to read. Now that doesn't mean to say that you can buy low cost load cells. Um, when we specify a load cell, for example, D1 class, we would specify it at 0.4% accuracy. But that's a number. With all of those uh, test criteria above, you can completely take to the bank. But unless you have a very, very uh, demanding uh, tank weighing accuracy requirement and you are able to build a tank that will allow the load cell to perform to its maximum potential, we usually do not encourage people to spend the extra money for this uh, 8 thousandths percent C6 tolerance. This just kind of give you a, um, just a rough idea of the product range itself. You know, we have several different types of load cells. Our smallest load cell is 30 kilo. Uh, on the upper left-hand corner here, these are very low, um, very low uh, profile units. I think the total height is less than one inch installed. You can have that up to uh, 300 kilo. So, as a practical matter, a um, a, uh, a four load cell system would be uh, 1,200 kilo or what, roughly a 2,800 pound tank you could support on less than one inch of actual load cell uh, height. The one next to it is just its big brother. Uh, that will take you from 500 kilogram to 10,000 kilogram, but even that one is under three inches in total height. So typically if a tank weighs under 80,000 pounds, we will not be adding more than three inches to your, the entire height of your system. The other, and these represent, these top two represent about 80% of what we see in the market. Um, the other ones are the extreme accuracy load cell. This is the one that's available in the C6 category for extraordinary accuracy. This is a level by weight for very ironically low accuracy applications, but very low cost. This is a very special scale, mostly used, or a special load cell, mostly used in pharmaceutical applications at the moment, but we're seeing more and more demand for extreme hygiene. It's a very funny looking load cell, as I think uh, everybody would attest. But it's actually made of a 316 titanium alloy stainless uh, with a very, very smooth surface. Bacteria will not form on that load cell. And the bell shape allows any wash down or any sort of uh, uh, cleaning material to sort of run off the side. So there's not pooling water allowed anywhere. Even in the mounting kit, uh, we, are, uh, we have no threads. Uh, everything is rounded. Uh, just to allow the maximum amount of sanitation. The cell to the right here is our big job, as you can see, 550,000 kilo. That's, what, 1.2 million pounds. So a four-cell four system would be upwards of 5 million pound tank. This is a very, very large tank. But this would be the cell, in fact, we would recommend for extreme vibration applications. The height gives us a bit of protection there, um, and it's uh, extraordinarily accurate as well. Okay, let's just, I always like to talk about, you know, what's different with Sartorius. Uh, rather than talk about all the things we think are important, let's talk about the things that are different from what you may have seen. Uh, we minimize, as we spoke already, the impact of internal vibration uh, and external vibration uh, mechanically. What you'll see, and you may have noticed in, in some of your tank installations right now, the electronic displays are filtered dramatically. Uh, we don't like to filter the display. We like to show you a real-time update, usually in the range of 10 display updates per second, so that filling can be very, very accurate. Uh, a lower quality load cell oftentimes is not as stable, and the way to get around apparent instability is to show you fewer numbers. So you may have tanks that are as slow as even one reading per second. This is um, not done because that's the design of the system. It's designed because that's the maximum speed at which you can show any kind of stability. So we, we tend to build a mechanically um, flawless cell rather than worry about uh, masking it with filters. We build match load cells. I need a quick explanation on this because it has uh, several, I hope that's large enough for everybody to see, uh, several uh, very important points. Match load cells are load cells in which at the factory, we actually set the, um, the actual output values of every load cell. When you buy a load cell from Sartorius, if we say it is one millivolt per volt, for example, output, that means it's not 0.98, it's not 0.97, it's not 1.1. It is 1.0000 and then maybe 634, depending on the accuracy class. They are manufactured to a very precise output standard. 
And there's a lot of reasons that makes a lot of sense. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a, set, uh, a minute. But the one that is most critical is the fact that they can literally be replaced in the field without the need to recalibrate. The load cell you pull out will be exactly the same as the load cell you replace it with. A high impedance cells, uh, most of our cells are um, a high impedance cells, which gives us some advantages in hazardous uh, environments. A lot of times a haz hazardous environment will dictate that we cannot um, send as much excitation voltage to the load cell, meaning we cannot get as much signal out. If we can't get as much signal out, we're not going to get as much accuracy. Fortunately, the power levels on these are very, very low uh, with the high impedance, and consequently we find that in typical hazardous environment, our load cells usually perform a bit better. There's 15-year warranty, nearly without exception. We talked about that earlier. Uh, abusive environments we talked about um, are ones that we find acceptable weighing installations. And then, of course, as we mentioned a second ago, 316 cells for ultra-sanitary applications and resistance to corrosive materials. Now let's talk a little bit about the matching of cells and what I call the black magic of installation without weights. And this is where if we had a live audience, I'd see your eyebrows raising right now. This is something that is uh, not done, if, if at all, in the industry outside of the Sartorius load cells. I mentioned a second ago that we've built every load cell to match. So we have a very precise control on the millivolt output signal at uh, the given capacity. This means a couple of things to us. First of all, because every load cell is identical, we don't need to adjust the load cells once they're installed. Uh, with our own shear beam load cells and lower quality load cells, we find it necessary when we have a, a set of four to actually go in and adjust each load cell individually so it comes up to exactly one millivolt or exactly two millivolt. Since every load cell for tank weighing that Sartorius makes is already adjusted to factory, we don't have trim pots in our junction boxes and don't need trim pots. Now, consequently, what this means, and if you talk to anybody in the scale repair business, they will tell you the most likely failure in a tank system is a junction box because the trim pots themselves get wet. That box is very likely to be washed down. It's very likely to have condensation and eventually corrode components. You could actually take the cover off of our junction box, hose it out uh, completely open, there would be no damage and no change in the weight because there are no components because they are not necessary. We talked about the interchanging of load cells. Um, and there is certainly additional level of water protection, as I said, when the trim pots are eliminated. And it ensures that every single cell that you buy today will be the same, identical to every cell that you buy in the future and every cell that we've manufactured in the past. Each cell comes with its own calibration certificate that assures that accuracy. We're doing a lot of these things today, um, these days, I should say, uh, portable and uh, fixed weighing applications. Portable applications are possible now that we have a mount that actually allows the load cell to float. Uh, as, the, as a wheel cart, as you see in the photo there, travels across the floor, the load cells that are right down here and here actually move with the floor. The load cells themselves don't move, but the mounting kits do. And that allows us to actually build very, very accurate portable systems that you can actually weigh and move from place to place. Now, why would you choose this over simply rolling a tank up onto a uh, platform scale? Well, usually space is a premium, and we find these going mostly in clean rooms. Obviously, when you equip your tanks, your portable tanks with load cells, there's no need for um, uh, uh, any additional space requirement at all. Uh, it's all self-contained. Sometimes the distance to the scale is too far. You can weigh it right on the spot. And then sometimes you need to mix and weigh simultaneously, which is something you could not do if you were to roll it up on a, on a platform scale. Now, we sell platform scales, too. So I won't stay away from, from those. There are reasons when you would choose a platform scale over a rolling mobile uh, tank outfitted with load cells. Maybe you have too many tanks to outfit with load cells. It can be very costly if you have half a dozen or more load cells as compared to the price of a single scale. Uh, lightweight vessels that can be easily rolled up on a ramp, no problem. We typically, uh, you see in the photo there, a low-profile pitless scale. Uh, we typically uh, roll up a one-inch incline with the ramp you see. Uh, it's not difficult at all for uh, tanks that are under, say, four or five, six hundred pounds. 
And of course, it accommodates any new tanks you add to the system. There's no need to, to remount any additional load cells. You can just continue to roll them up. What's the price differential? This is very rough. Don't take me to the bank on this one. I, it depends on options and everything else. But typically, a portable tank solution with load cells and instrumentation is in the $6,000 range. A low profile scale can vary uh, pretty dramatically, as you see, from anywhere between nine to $15,000. If you do the math, I think it's, it's pretty clear. Anything under you know, uh, three tanks is probably more efficient to equip it with load cells. Certainly easier to use and takes up less space. If you've got four or five or six tanks uh, and you're not rolling them long distances, then you'd buy the four scale. OK, design considerations. These are the things that I, I wish people would call me. <laughs> please, please call me uh, when you're working on a tank, because there are some things we can do that will save you a lot of money and us a lot of grief down the road. The first and most important three waypoints are better than four or six or eight or whatever you feel you might want to put on a tank. Uh, the reason is very simple. First of all, cost is 25% uh, less. You're using one less load cell, one less mounting kit. And the fact that anytime you have a three-point stance, you always have compression, even under very slowed conditions. There's no way with three points of load introduction to have any one point ever simply mechanically impossible. A four-point system could possibly have one cell that's under compressed, because of course the tank can rest on three. Minimize the dead load. This is this is kind of a big deal. Of course, we're weighing the entire tank all the time. And um, we, we run into applications where there'll be a very, very, very heavy mixer or other equipment on top of the tank that will cause us to have a unusable weight of maybe 90% of the range of the load cell. The lower the load cell can be proportional to the live weight, the better off you will be in terms of accuracy. Um, and this is kind of common sense. If you have a mezzanine mount where the tank is suspended through a mezzanine, just be sure to get the support columns close by. That eliminates the influence of foot traffic and other things that might be going on on the mezzanine that might influence the, the weight perceived by the load cells. Uh, the taller load cells are definitely the better ones in high The legs will literally vibrate during normal operation. You probably need the taller load cells. They're going to give you a better uh, performance. If you have high temperature applications, you may need to specify our high temperature cells. We do make load cells where the strain gauges are actually etched into the stainless, and they will take um, you know, 200 degrees Fahrenheit or more and still operate fine. Uh, anytime you can substitute fewer legs for, um, for multiple legs for fewer legs, it's, um, it's, it's going to be a, a stronger design. A lot, oftentimes we'll see skirted tanks, which are very, very difficult to mount on load cells. Uh, the fewer points, as I said in point one, the better off we are. If there's any way to sort of um, reduce the number of legs, maybe with some sort of a sandwich design, where you've perhaps got six or eight legs coming down to a square tubing, three load cells in between, six or eight feet on the bottom. That uh, will save you money and uh, perform better. Accuracy considerations, rigid piping, there's a bunch of those that scare me. Clean in place, uh, stainless pipes attached to the side of the load cell. Those are always difficult. I know you can't avoid them. But uh, the longer run you can make on the stainless, the less influence they will have on the accuracy of the weighing. I see a lot of customers who take uh, flex tubing. They put it in. They twist it uh, more to make the fittings fix than to allow flex. We don't need to have a pre-flexed flex fitting. That does no good. If you have a fitting that is straight and can flex up or down, right or left, that's what we want to see. Uh, and then tank-to-tank -tank rigid connections. Occasionally, we'll see tanks cascaded together, uh, connected with rigid stainless piping. When you weigh one tank on the end, you're actually weighing part of the tank at the other end. Those are things to, to watch out for. Oh, horizontal screw mixers with powdered material. That's the toughest one. You've got load shifting across the base of the, the tank. Always difficult. Um, if you can do a, a vertical mixer, we're way better. Low-resolution instrumentation will have a um, an impact. Their instrumentation varies. We have competitors out there for 300 bucks. You can spend $4,000 for instrumentation. Believe me, there is a difference. If the resolution of the instrumentation is no good, it will not help you when you come to uh, take the data from the cells. 
Uh, load cells that are not secured to the floor or used without mounting kits. Okay? Occasionally you have people who want to buy the cells and just simply build their own kits. It'll work, but you're defeating a lot of the um, floating capability and constraining capability that we build into our mounting kits. Uh, extreme uplift can be a problem. Uh, I've seen a 25,000 pound steel rod dropped on one end of a scale and actually lift it off the other end of the scale. Anytime you can avoid that kind of a situation, uh, it's, uh, you're going to get much greater accuracy. And as we talked before, accuracy expectations greater than 400 of a percent are usually not achievable. I'd like to say every installation is so clean they can use our most accurate load cell. That's just simply not the case. In fact, the truth is most of the time we're very happy with a tenth of a percent. Not because the load cells are the limitation necessarily, but the piping, the vibration, all of the other factors that go into design of the tank uh, actually reduce the overall accuracy. And cost considerations, specify the proper instrumentation. A uh, couple of things here. A, as I said a second ago, the instrumentation varies dramatically. We have instrumentation that is extraordinarily accurate for as little as six or seven hundred dollars, but it cannot be expanded to a complete control system. Uh, don't over-purchase the instrumentation or anticipate that you're going to expand um, a high-end controller. Uh, the problem is, and the truth is, I should say that if you buy a low-end controller and throw it away, when you're ready to go to, an ex to a more expensive um, con uh, controller that is running your entire system, you're probably better off than investing in an expensive stripped controller um, and trying to build on it from there. Uh, be certain to use stainless only when necessary. In some cases, stainless mounts will double the price. Uh, home run cable, I, I've seen more wasted home run cable. This is the cable that runs from the junction box to the instrumentation. Just buy a big bulk reel and cut it to size. That's the best way. We offer, um, you know, like 10-foot sets and 30-foot sets and 50-foot sets and 100-foot sets. And it just seems like there's always a lot of wasted cell, uh, load cell cable when you do that. Use the 6211s when tanks are under 100,000 pounds. That's the low-profile 3-inch tall cell. We can support tanks up to that large. It will definitely save some money in the overall cost of the system. You can do a level by weight, uh, which is an, a system in which we use, on a four-legged system, use two load cells on one side of the tank. Don't get your accuracy expectations up, but the costs are very low. We can usually, for um, uh, liquid material, uh, stay in the range of 2% or less accuracy. You buy a couple of load cells for as little as uh, $2,000 complete with instrumentation, you can be, you can be weighing your tank. Um, but the accuracy will be limited. All right, I'll talk about those. Going instrumentation, just about to the end here. Um, I don't want to go into great detail. The sky is the limit when it comes to instrumentation. We, just, but we usually divide the world into three categories. Display only, uh, instrumentation that transmits data, or controllers that actually control other process functions. Uh, the display one is exactly as you would expect. It is usually used just as a visual ch double check on what's going on in the process. Normally it's mounted right near the tank. Uh, very inexpensive, yet quite accurate. Uh, the transmit type uh, indicators will include every possible uh, data protocol, from device net to Ethernet IP to whatever you can dream up. Uh, not terribly expensive, uh, but able to talk to virtually any system. The controller is actually a PLC emulator. This gets into a little more expensive uh, device, but it is quite capable of doing some very sophisticated batching systems, um, actually um, you know, controlling your, um, we've got relay outputs, we have all sorts of things that you can control your process directly, even without a PLC using our controller indicators. Uh, this is actually a slide second to last here, we actually normally show to our salespeople, but I think it's applicable here too. These are the points that we, we ask our, our salespeople to look for when they walk through a plant, because these are the areas in which we really do the best where we find um, competitors kind of fall by the wayside. Tank agitation, if you've got mixing and weighing, especially if the, the tank motor extends beyond the side of the tank and is causing the tank to tilt, maybe not visibly tilt, but the load cells know it's tilting, 
So that's good for us. Uh, tanks with heating and cooling jackets, perfect application for sartoria. Tanks that visibly vibrate when filling or discharging material. Most load cells, shear beam cells, will pick up that vibration. Sartorius load cells will ignore it. Uh, when we see employees running around with chemical or uh, heat protective clothing, these load cells can be underwater for 15 years. And when you take them out, they will have the same accuracy. So we are looking for applications in which we are really, really challenged with difficult environmental issues. And when we see people running around with protective clothing, that's usually a good thing for us. We, um, we normally are able to uh, add material directly to the tanks. A lot of, a lot of you may have little um, manual batching scales sitting next to the tanks that uh, you fill uh, maybe a 10-pound batch and then dump it manually into a much larger tank. The accuracy is such on the Sartorius uh, load cells that we are often able to actually batch directly into the tank without the need for a separate uh, sample uh, sampling scale. Uh, manually batching, again, we can do this automatically with one of the controllers. When we see material move from one process to another in wheeled tanks, it's always a good recommendation for us to put the tank itself on wheel or on um, on load cells. And outdoor tanks that are subject to very uh, high weather extremes are are definitely uh, applications that we like to focus on. Um, in fact, as we said in the second slide, anything that would be considered an extreme application is where we'll probably fit in best. And then finally, um, we come down to just results. What are we looking for here? Uh, Sartorius actually specifies the alloy of every load cell that we build. We can trace every single load cell by serial number back to the original billet of stainless that it was manufactured from. We, uh, we define the exact alloy we like to see, and every uh, load cell is traceable so we can research any problem that may occur at any point in time. Uh, we've had a tremendous experience. Uh, we actually came in the lab business 140 years ago, very high accuracy instrumentation. We've applied that to our, our load cell business. And then, of course, we test Every single cell, not just random tests, every single cell is tested for, uh, with um, a helium tests to see if there's leakage. Uh, we issue a certificate of performance and calibration with every individual load cell so you know exactly what you're getting because we have tested every load cell. Uh, bottom line is tank and hopper systems are about saving money, waste, saving labor. Uh, this is what we want to provide for you. We, uh, we do not have the cheapest solution on the market, for sure, but we're also not the most expensive. But I dare say the results are probably going to exceed your expectations. That's it for my side. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, the only question I have, this is Leslie Springwood Company, is uh, when can we get some pricing on these? I'd say today would be a good yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> we can probably take care of that fairly quickly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, will, if, uh, uh, if uh, our salesman can contact me, that'd be great. I'll, I'll have him do that today. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Steve, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, if you do have application questions after you hang up and go away and start to think about it, Please feel free to give us a call. Our uh, 800 number is 809 Lessman. If you don't know your account manager, feel free to ask for me, Mike D. Lecluse, and I'll make sure that you get taken care of. Uh, a lot of these products can be found on our website, which is uh, www.lessman.com. Uh, later today, this will be posted to the web, so you can replay it for associates. Uh, well, and I'd also like to invite you to join our LinkedIn forum, which will uh, keep you up to date on other seminars that are coming up as well. Uh, there is a mixer video that will be posted to the website as well, and it actually shows the load cells in action with a, uh, with a, mixer. With a mixer. And uh, it's, it's quite impressive. So if you, if you want to see it uh, in action, Go ahead and check out our website. It's, it's on there. Uh, our next webinar is uh, September 24th. 
And the topic for that one is Combustion and Flame Safety Controls. Uh, it'll be presented by Dan Weisey uh, of Lessman, and it will happen again at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, again, thank you very much for attending. And if you don't have any further questions, that'll be it.